Um, before we uh, go to our next presentation, um, I mentioned to you this morning that we have a special guest and uh, told you a little bit about what was going on. And um, we asked him if he would come and visit again this year and he and his wife have uh, generously given their time to come up here from Indianapolis. And I would like to introduce to you Ryan and Julie Deem, a Ryan former right tackle for the Indianapolis Colts. So Ryan and Julie. Thank you, thank you Pat. Thank you guys so much for having us and uh, letting us take a, a brief moment of this very important uh, weekend. Um, so yeah, like Pat said, We've been helping out with CNCF uh, for, gosh, 10 years now. Um, 10 years ago, Julie and I were looking for a cause to kind of rally behind um, and, and use our platform to, to help promote the cause and, and grow the cause and raise funds for the cause. And this um, particular cause kind of found us through Pat and um, my high school football coach. She reached out through him. I came to the uh, very first golf outing that uh, was hosted by the Juicen family that was for their friends. Um, the event is called the Alley and Friends Golf Classic. And um, I just attended the first event, uh, played in it, got to know the Juicen family, got to know Pat, got to know the cause, and um, we just felt like it was something that we needed to, uh, to help grow. And, and you know, what, I, I just couldn't think of a better cause to, to get behind. So over the years, we've done some good stuff. Um, in our first nine years, we raised a million dollars, and all of that money. Thank you, appreciate it. All that money went directly to CNCF. And last year um, was my first year coming to the conference to uh, just see what this was actually all about. And I quickly found out how, uh, how important it was um, for the parents, and, and, and not only the parents, but the kids, too. It was uh, a lot of fun to be in the, the kids' room playing with them. I can assure you they're, they're safe. They're having a great time. Uh, <laughs> I was dodging uh, socks and, and balls the second I walked in there. They're, they're playing some kind of sock tag game where I guess they knocked down a chandelier, but <laughs> everything's all right. Everyone's safe. Don't worry about it. Uh, but everyone's having a great time. And, and I, I took that message back to our event um, this year, which was in early May, and uh, just kind of reflected on it and, and how important it was. And um, people were extremely generous. We, we raised um, almost, as, almost the, the highest amount of money we've ever raised. And since the economy kind of took a dive in 08, 09, our numbers had been down a little bit. But um, I think, you know, things are starting to turn around and, and people saw the value and importance of a weekend like this and wanted to support it. And our um, fund to cure portion of the um, auction that we, you know, we do every year, basically people are bidding on just to donate. And I think the past few years, those numbers have been down around, you know, 12, 13, maybe 15,000 total. We raised, I don't know, 37, $37,000 this year just because people um, got a better idea of what this event was all about. And um, we just, you know, we're just real proud of the fact that we're able to help you, um, families like yourself. And, um, you know, Julie and I will be committed to this cause as long as there's a need. God bless you all and your families. You're all in our prayers. Thank you. Thank you. Um, and, and I thank Ryan and Julie and his entire family. His mom is here in the back there, too. Um, they've reached out to um, business associates, um, Indianapolis Colts. Uh, Dallas Clark, Peyton Manning, Coach Tony Dungy had been here. Uh, they've all participated in this golf outing. And um, we just can't thank them enough, because like I said, the money that was raised this past year, um, when we started getting the 
funds, we did the counter and we saw all the money piling up because it was silent so we didn't know. All we did was see the numbers continuously grow and grow and grow and grow. And we just sat there with wide, eyes wide open like, oh my God, we have $37,000 to put this conference on because that was specifically for this. We raised net, we raised 120,000 and 37,000 of that was just for all of you to be here. So I just want to thank Ryan and Julie very, very much for their continued support. All right, now I'm gonna start crying again. Um, our, our next speaker uh, is Dr. Mostufi, uh, completed her dual training in pediatric oncology and endocrinology at the Children's Hospital of Philadelphia, where she is now an assistant professor of pediatrics in the division of oncology. Her research and clinical focus include endocrine late effects after childhood cancer therapy, and she sees patients as part of the CHOP survivorship team. Dr. Mostufi also has a clinical interest and expertise in endocrine tumors, including thyroid cancer, particularly in um, childhood cancer survivors. She has a master in clinical epidemiology and devotes 75% of her time to clinical research and late effects of cancer therapy, specifically bone and body composition abnormalities um, after stem cell transplantation. Her research efforts are supported by the NIH, Childhood Cancer Survivor Study, Alex Lemonade Stan, St. Baldrick's. She is an active participant in CCSS and COG late effects. And she is gonna be talking about endocrine late effects after neuroblastoma therapy. Dr. Mostufi. So I hope I can get this set up and uh, technology-wise I can turn things on. So I think of myself as a hybrid, you know, someone who has done both oncology and endocrinology and really my passion is pediatric oncology, but the area of focus that um, I am here today to help you understand and share with you is really the endocrine late effects after childhood cancer therapy. Um, what I want to make sure that we all understand is that this is a field that still is in its infancy, particularly with respect to high-risk neuroblastoma survivors, given that in the last decade or so we have done tremendous strides in terms of having more survivors join the rank of survivorship, and some of the endocrine late effects, even though they are the hallmark of uh, the issues that I have to address in clinic, are not very well characterized. So I am hoping that as the years come, we as a group, not only within the children's oncology group, but overall can come together and establish more objective studies really to not only characterize, but more importantly, start addressing a lot of these endocrine late effects that we see in our high risk survivors. So with this, what I'd like to actually start off with is an important study that was published in the Journal of Clinical Oncology. And, and really what I want to highlight is that when you look at survivors of childhood cancer therapy and compare them to their siblings and look at sort of overall different uh, conditions that you can see and with respect to the grades of those conditions, um, in general, childhood cancer survivors have six-fold, almost six-fold risk of having an endocrine problem. And really what's more um, significant is actually if you look at the higher grades of toxicity, so grade three and four, so the really more worrisome related side effects within that endocrine system, actually, again, it's up to six-fold higher. And like any time I meet a family from a you know, survivorship standpoint in my clinic, I typically say it's almost unheard of to successfully make it through childhood cancer therapy and not have the need to see an endocrinologist. So overall, it is actually one of the number one morbidities that I have to address. Um, it can only be one of the endocrine systems. It can be more than one, but in general, it is something that uh, we typically have to provide our services. So what I'm gonna outline this talk, I'm gonna give you brief overviews. Some of these, we have a lot more information. Some of this, I can just give you kind of a, what we think is the uh, significant problems and hope to find out more about that in the future. But I will start with growth because I personally, not the fact that I'm the tiniest probably person here in this room, but I think that growth is actually a significant problem in our survivors. And I'd like to actually highlight that. Uh, some of the challenges that we see, I would like to talk about thyroid related problems, some of the issues that happen not only around the time of therapy, but more importantly in long-term survivors, particularly survivors who are of the era who receive total body radiation. 
I will touch base on puberty problems, gonadal function overall. Um, I'm not going to go into fertility preservation in detail because I think that in and of itself is a topic that requires uh, hours of discussion. And then briefly touch base on other um, problems such as diabetes mellitus, insulin resistance, and bone health. I think these last two areas are areas that really require a lot of attention in our survivors. So there's no other fundamental topic other than growth in pediatrics. So I think pediatrics is a time that um, you need to not only build your bones, but more importantly from a growth standpoint, your need for coordinated action of not only growth hormone production, but also just sort of rallying the sex hormones of the puberty and just sort of all the building blocks. So there is no doubt that uh, challenges with childhood cancer therapy can significantly impact that. So regardless of the childhood cancer diagnosis, in general, when you have a successful survivor that you are meeting in clinic, I usually highlight the fact that it's very difficult to make it through a long-term treatment regimen without having some sort of a growth effect. And what that can be seen is usually, and I think as parents you can probably agree with me that survivors typically are um, shorter than their siblings. So it's very difficult to actually meet your genetic potential, particularly with some of the regimens that we have to introduce to treat the cancer successfully. And there's a lot of contributing factors. So, you know, the actual disease itself, depending on what the disease is and sort of what areas of the body it affects, sometimes it can be directly contributing from the disease itself. Um, the nutritional aspect that comes with cancer therapy. So you can have all the appropriate hormones in the world, but if you don't get your building blocks from a nutritional standpoint, that can have uh, a negative impact as the child is going through cancer therapy that sometimes is difficult to really catch up with that afterwards. And then the regimens that we use. So there is no doubt that a developing skeleton and just sort of overall a growing child is a significant risk for having a negative impact with respect to the high doses of chemotherapeutic regimens we use. Obviously, neuroblastoma is not a regimen where steroids are the backbone part of that therapy. Um, for example, leukemia tends to be more of a challenge where we have to also use a lot of steroids, and those all significantly um, have negative impacts on growth. But then not to forget spine radiation. So a lot of our patients, a lot of our neuroblastoma patients, we have to give radiation to the primary site, and obviously the adrenals and the um, radiation exposure to the spine can certainly negatively impact the growth. And then after that, you can have the other endocrine pro problems that just sort of superimpose. So your thyroid hormone is important to help you with growth, so you can develop problems with the thyroid gland. Sometimes from a puberty standpoint, things can happen either on the early side, which is not very helpful when it's, uh, you know, with respect to growth-related problems, or on the flip side, you can have actually problems with going through puberty because of the damage to the gonads, which are the organs that have to make your puberty hormones, and those all can really impact in terms of sort of the coordinated effort that's required for appropriate growth. So before I kind of get into some of the information on growth, I think it's helpful to understand Z-scores, so this way we're sort of all on the same page, because it's really important to understand how you evaluate someone's growth overall. So typically, when you think about growth-related problems, you have to sort of uh, normalize it to the mean. So when you, think, when you actually report someone's Z-score, a Z-score of zero, which is sort of the average population, if you look at the normal distribution, a Z-score of zero corresponds to the 50th percentile. So when someone actually ends up, when you normalize them to the mean with a Z-score of negative two, as you can see that that's like significantly shifted to the left side of this curve. So overall, um, when we say the median population in a cancer survivor, for example, has a median Z-score of negative two or negative 1.8, that can tell you that on average that group of survivors have a height Z-score that's less than the you know, fifth percentile. So that kind of puts things into perspective. So a lot of the other data that I will present is in Z-scores, but I want you to think about these numbers because zero and negative one and two may not necessarily make sense otherwise. Um, but in general, so there's a significant decrease in linear growth, and uh, total body radiation, which thankfully is no longer being used, has a significant negative impact, not only on growth, but also on final stature. So I am now seeing a difference in terms of survivors who are of the TBI era with respect to high-risk neuroblastoma and the survivors who are currently not getting treated with total body radiation. 
And uh, clearly when growth hormone becomes an issue, and I'll shortly go into why is it that you can develop growth hormone deficiency, but in high-risk neuroblastoma survivors who have growth hormone deficiency, the final height actually is significantly more impacted compared to their counterpart peers who did not develop growth hormone deficiency. And as you can see here, even these average Z-scores are fairly uh, notable. So again, short stature is something that is fairly prevalent in survivors of neuroblastoma therapy. And the other thing that's really important to highlight here, and I'm very honest with every family when I actually have a family meeting in our clinic, is that in general, high-risk neuroblastoma survivors have the least uh, response to growth hormone therapy compared to some of our other survivors. That has not been elucidated in terms of what exactly is the mechanism. So um, my personal bias is that a lot of this has to go with the actual therapy that we have to offer to cure neuroblastoma that has a negative impact on the growth uh, receptors and just sort of overall the response because a lot of times you over replace even growth hormone and I actually don't see the appropriate response. And this is uh, straight across the community. So even different uh, um, set, you know, endocrinologists who specifically take care of survivors either at Memorial Sloan and other large centers with um, survivor population with neuroblastoma have the same uh, experience in terms of out of all the groups of survivors, in general, the growth response is not as optimal. So in terms of the whole growth um, production, it's a little bit complicated, but it's important to understand what are the risk factors for cancer therapy. So what is it that I think of when I meet a um, you know, cancer survivor in terms of the risk factors from their therapy? So overall, if you get cranial radiation or total body radiation, which again is fractionated radiation where the brain or the pituitary gland is exposed, that's where you make your growth hormone. It's within the pituitary gland, the anterior pituitary. So it's actually the most common hormone that gets affected after radiation. So it's an extremely sensitive area to radiation. And the thing that's actually important is that the severity and how quickly you develop growth hormone deficiency depends on the dose of radiation. So if you give very high doses of radiation, so that would be, for example, some of our brain tumor survivors. But in the neuroblastoma uh, group, I worry about uh, young children who needed to get cranial radiation for uh, metastatic sites to the bone and the cal you know in the skull bone so that actually can at result in growth hormone deficiency and then the other thing that's important is that the effects of radiation are time dependent so it may not have been an issue two years three years from radiation but it significantly can uh, raise its ugly head or declare itself many years after the therapy so that's one of the things that I always highlight why it's important for a survivor to not only get their treatment in a pediatric standpoint, but once they reach adulthood, it's very important for them to continue to see an endocrinologist. And I think the very important thing to highlight is age at the time of radiation exposure is a significant risk factor for growth hormone deficiency. So you don't need a high dose of radiation to actually have problems with growth hormone production. And this is really the problem with the total body radiation arrow because majority of our patients were receiving the TBI at a very young age. And as you can see here, I just sort of briefly put the study that if you compare a group of adults to young children who receive total body radiation. So if you look at the dose there, that's actually not a very high dose, and especially if it's fractionated, the thought would be that there is that's such a low dose that it really should not impact uh, growth hormone production. And so two and a half years, so that's sort of the typical time frame that um, radiation-related growth problems typically tend to manifest themselves. So if you look at this group, when they examined 18 adults, they gave them insulin. You make the person hypoglycemic or drop the blood sugar. That's a significant stimulus for the body to raise its growth hormone response. So that's actually called, considered the gold standard way of evaluating if someone is making enough growth hormone. And as you can see in these 18 adults, really no one after total body radiation had any problems with that appropriate response. But almost 50% of the young children after TBI had um, notable difficulty in uh, responding to, you know, having an appropriate growth hormone response. And this is a bigger problem in pediatrics because childhood and then subsequently puberty is really the time where you have to rally and have a lot of growth hormone. And I typically say it's almost like a period of gigantism. So the amount of growth hormone you need to produce during childhood and, adult, and uh, puberty especially is significantly higher than an adult. So a lot of our survivors, once they make it through adulthood and they are off of their growth hormone therapy, actually do fine as adults, um, mainly because the, the amount of growth hormone that they produce is enough for adulthood, but it's definitely not enough for childhood. This is a study that was actually recently 
published out of the Dana-Farber, and it's one of the studies that has at least tried to um, describe some of the late effects, particularly with respect to endocrine in uh, neuroblastoma survivors. So, and of this population, so it's basically they had a group of 47 patients, long-term survivors, so they could go through and classify and kind of give some of their hormone-related problems. Seven of these subjects actually had growth hormone deficiency, or at least they, they could elicit that from the charts to say, okay, these are the patients that had a diagnosis of growth hormone deficiency, and they were treated with growth hormone. Um, and as you can see, so overall, these patients are starting at a much lower, um, again, these are Z-scores, so the, I put this pink line there just to kind of give you an idea what a Z-score of uh, 0 or 50th percentile would correspond. So sharp drop after um, neuroblastoma therapy. And so once these patients are actually within remission and in an appropriate time frame, so we typically wait at least a minimum of two years from being in remission prior to actually introducing growth hormone. Um, but you know, typically, as you can see, even the final adult height, at least in the two patients that, of the seven that they gave, these patients are significantly below the 50th percentile. So um, short stature, a notable problem, even with respect to growth hormone and the treatment with growth hormone not um, the best, you know, sort of final outcome that we see. And, you know, in terms of, so how is it that we can diagnose growth problems? And I think in pediatrics, one of the most important and sensitive markers is assessing growth velocity. So I think that that's where the appropriate measurements and plotting and looking at a child's growth rate is, is the gold standard. And it's actually what um, those of us who really take care of a lot of cancer survivors use our, our way of diagnosing, because a lot of other conventional ways where pediatric endocrinologists who may not be as familiar with the cancer survivor population may not necessarily um, certainly recognize that you can have problems in growth hormone production because clearly the growth rate is what's showing you that problem, but the typical testing that we do may not find those. So I don't use growth factors alone as a way. I don't necessarily feel that the growth hormone testing that a lot of physicians rely on is, is sort of appropriate because you can still have a lot of growth-related problems. So growth rate is really the gold standard. And one thing to so during cancer therapy, it's very difficult to have a good growth rate. So clearly the body is going to prioritize the nutritional problems. Just the cancer therapy itself is anti-growth in general. But overall, kids should recover. So, and what I look at, so when I'm seeing a survivor two to three years after their high-risk therapy, if they're continuing to fall off the growth chart, that to me is a big red flag. So in, in pediatrics, overall, how kids grow, they're very faithful to their growth chart. So you kind of pick that line, and a lot of times that line, there's a lot of things that goes into it, but your genetic potential plays a big role. So sort of the genes that come from mom and dad and the grandparents, everything that gets shuffled, but sort of that genetic potential, you sort of stay on that curve, and you should stay on that line. You should not start falling off that line. Anytime a child is falling off the line, you really need to discuss or look into that further to see, is it because nutrition is a problem, they're losing a lot of weight. You can have all the growth hormone in the world, but if you don't have the appropriate nutritional blocks, that child will not grow. So, but in general, so anytime that there's deviation, if there's a drop in the growth velocity less than the 25th percentile, and there are appropriate curves that we can actually uh, figure out what the growth velocity is. And you actually know what's an appropriate minimum amount of growth a child should have before they start puberty in a year, and then how that should get extrapolated after they go into puberty. So growth rate actually doubles once someone goes into puberty. And I, I think accurate measurement, I can't highlight that, so that's really important in terms of making sure that the child is measured appropriately. And a lot of times, if you really want to kind of separate the effects of the radiation on the spine, you can do other measurements, like sitting measurements as well. So the other thing I wanted to um, at least highlight is because this is something that when I see patients for a second opinion, there are children who were that obviously noted to have growth hormone deficiency after cancer therapy. Um, but some endocrinologists who may not be as familiar with the literature have counseled families away from starting growth hormone because what they focus on is say, you know what, if we give growth hormone, the cancer is going to come back. And that's something I really want to highlight that yes, growth hormone can make things grow, but there's currently nothing in the literature that actually supports treating a child's growth hormone deficiency that's secondary to the radiation effect. Once that child is proven that they're in appropriate remission time frame, that's gonna basically treatment with growth hormone is gonna cause the recurrence of the primary tumor. And I will show you some literature on that. But I, that's a very important message that I wanna make sure, because I've seen some children who I 
um, was a little bit dismayed in terms of some of the years of therapy that would have benefited and was not offered. And this is just education in the community. But I think as advocates, because I find obviously as parents of cancer survivors, you are excellent advocates for your children. So it helps for the education to start here. Um, why have some of these information kind of come out into the literature? So in adults who have tumors in the pituitary that cause growth hormone production called acromegaly, there were some earlier what we call epidemiology literatures that highlighted, oh, these uh, adults can have an increased risk for colon cancer. A lot of these studies were basically biased, retrospective, not a large population to kind of really confirm that a lot of conflicting results. So it's really not necessarily even proven that that uh, correlation actually exists. And then very early on when growth hormone was introduced, there was a study out of Japan that said, oh, patients who get growth hormone therapy have an increased leukemia risk. Unfortunately, that study was never able to be validated. And now basically what large groups of uh, patients who have received growth hormone therapy through um, the different um, pharmaceutical companies who support production of growth hormone, and we have had large numbers of not only cancer survivors, but also other patients who require growth hormone therapy, that has not been proven. So the risk of leukemia is definitely not present. But overall, I think a survivor is very different than a child who, let's say, is born without a pituitary gland. So having had the exposure to chemotherapy and radiation puts that child in a different bracket than someone who needs growth hormone because they don't have a pituitary gland. Um, and then I think the other thing that I want to highlight is there are definitely studies that also have shown your growth factors. Um, if they're the IGF-1, which is one of the typical growth factors, um, is very, very high, and then the igf bp 3 is very, very low, those patients are at risk for some of the uh, obvious adult malignancies like breast cancer, colon cancer, and prostate cancer. The thing that's really important to realize is that in childhood, or in general, when you replace with growth hormone, both of these growth factors go up simultaneously and they keep each other in check. So overall, it's just that discordance. If you have very high IGF-1 and low igf bp 3 you worry about the uh, mitogenic effects of growth hormone. But in the therapy, actually, BP3 rises very significantly as much as the IGF-1, and it actually keeps each other in check. This is a study from the Childhood Cancer Survivor Study that basically looked at uh, a group of survivors who were treated. So this is probably the largest cohort. Um, the number is a little bit fuzzy, but it's 362 survivors who were treated with growth hormone because of growth hormone deficiency that developed because of the cancer therapy. And then they compare them to a large cohort. It's almost 11,000 survivors who did not require growth hormone therapy because they did not have growth hormone deficiency. And they actually had 17 high-risk neuroblastoma patients in this cohort, which I think I highlight that just because I think it's an important um, not many studies are this large in terms of being able to include um, high-risk neuroblastoma survivors. And as you can see, what they truly showed is the risk of primary disease recurrence is no different as a survivor if you needed to go on growth hormone therapy versus a survivor who never needed to go on growth hormone therapy. So I think with respect to primary disease recurrence, I do not withhold growth hormone, nor do I recommend growth hormone to be held if the child has been appropriately in remission. So I think that that's an important thing um, to think about. Now, the secondary malignancies, I think a lot of more information and data is coming into that. But I think what really clouds that is when you already are coming into this equation with um, you know, radiation exposure, chemotherapy, some of those cumulative effects, that your risk for secondary malignancies are very different. Um, and a lot of those relative risk factors that were reported earlier on actually with repeating and designing studies that are better powered to answer that question are not actually showing those effects. And I would also say that in the larger centers, such as Children's Hospital of Philadelphia, Memorial Sloan, we are not necessarily seeing a large increase in secondary malignancies in uh, survivors who've actually treated with growth hormone. But like everything, you know, it's, it's an honest uh, discussion that I have with families. So what about response to growth hormone therapy? So I think overall, in the beginning, the growth hormone response is actually fairly reasonable. What is, uh, um, and what I mean by that, it's actually comparable to patients who have um, non-cancer survivors who have idiopathic growth hormone deficiency who go on growth hormone. The early response is actually great, but what, act, what tends to be a problem is this catch-up growth. So, um, and that is a lot of it is, these are the problems that sort of the spine radiation and some of the other effects of cancer therapy then kind of uh, give itself hand and, and become more of a, of a problem. And there's a lot of contributing factors. So again, I, I highlighted the spine radiation. I think early puberty is a significant uh, challenge that's not necessarily looked into. 
um, in our survivors for high-risk neuroblastoma who have been treated with cis-retinoic acid, the bones actually advance. And what I mean by that is when you get an x-ray of the hand, that's what the endocrinology doctors usually do, it's actually the skeletal age that the body uses as a clock. And so if you're 10, but because of the cis-retinoic acid therapy, your bones are actually 12 or 12 and a half, 13, that's the biology clock that the body says, now it's time to start puberty. And so if you're starting puberty, but height is already significantly affected, you're actually starting that when you're chronologically 10, but the body thinks you're 12 and a half, you're losing out of um, you know, potential time because the bones are gonna start advancing once they start uh, getting exposed to the puberty hormone. So I think that that also the early puberty can have a negative impact on your final height. And then this uh, delayed initiation of growth hormone therapy. So a lot of times the, the you know, providers may actually recognize that this child is not growing, they have growth hormone deficiency, but it's just not being comfortable in introducing the growth hormone and then just the inadequacy. So you really need to um, essentially be aggressive, adjust the growth hormone dose, so patients actually need more frequent follow-up time because those first few years of growth hormone response make a big difference. This is a chart just sort of to highlight you in terms um, here. This is a patient, this is a cancer survivor, so again, they started the growth hormone therapy, they stopped the puberty because as you can see, the child actually started um, changing lines or sort of accelerating growth, which is what the body normally will, will do in time of puberty, but this was obviously at a very young age, a nine and a half to 10 years, so that would significantly impact in terms of where your final adult height will be. So they started the, uh, a medicine that can stop puberty. It just sort of, sort of turns puberty off, and then subsequently when we stop the medicine, the puberty comes down, uh, comes, it starts back up again. And then essentially when the growth plates fuse, you stop the growth hormone therapy, and this is sort of where the final adult height is. But when you tease out in terms of the total growth, so if I measure the child from the tip of the toes to the top of the head, which is what this lower curve is showing, and then if you actually do a sitting height where you're measuring the spine, as you can see, the spine is actually having a stunted uh, growth response. So during puberty, spine actually has to have a very nice growth response, and that is what I always tell families in terms of our expectation for where the final adult height should be. So spine growth in general is uh, negatively impacted by radiation. So what about uh, thyroid disease? So I think actually one of the easiest, I don't mean to discount, but probably one of the simplest uh, um, hormone-related problems that can be addressed with one little pill that has really no significant uh, side effects is thyroid disorder. So um, total body radiation can clearly negatively impact the function of the thyroid. It doesn't make the thyroid stop working. It just basically doesn't function as normally as it should. And because thyroid hormone is important for growth, I think um, it's very important to screen regularly for thyroid, and if it is off, or if the thyroid studies definitely indicate that there's an abnormality, there's no harm in starting thyroid hormone, particularly as that child is uh, uh, going through growth. Um, remember all those SSKI drops that you have to give your children and they hate it because it tastes terribly? So the reason we actually do that is to protect the thyroid gland. Um, but despite being very compliant and doing everything that we tell you to do, despite all the SSKIs, we can still have um, problems with respect to the thyroid not working well because the negative impact of MIBG. Not only screen, and I think what we need to find out is what's going to happen with high-dose MIBG treatment that now is getting incorporated in upfront therapy. So I think despite everything that we do to protect the gland, I think some of the negative impact or down the road effects are not necessarily as clear. Um, it's not as common to have problems with overactive thyroid. So in general, your thyroid-related problems tends to be because the gland is just not working well. This is, an, this is another important area that I tend to think about my uh, survivors who had total body radiation when they were two, three, four, and now they're teenagers. Because I think the radiation impact on the gland, it's subsequently in terms of thyroid nodules, and then a secondary malignancy or thyroid malignancy becomes an important thing to think about. Um, this is also another area that we don't know what MIBG does. So I think the only way that we can figure a lot of this important is by doing studies and making sure that the surveillance um, of that survivor is under the care of uh, providers who have expertise in survivorship. And this slide actually highlights in terms of when you get um, radiation. So this would probably be obviously a patient if uh, you had your primary disease in the chest that required radiation therapy. So the higher the dose of the radiation, the higher the probability of developing an underactive thyroid. It is time dependent, but in general within the first five years 
Um, female sex in some of the studies has um, been recognized. So if you're a female and you get radiation, higher risk for developing a non-directive thyroid. I think overall it's just basically the higher dose of radiation, um, much higher risk for essentially developing a non-directive thyroid. Um, but it is something I screen regularly, at least annually if I see a patient or if there are more complicated other issues that I'm looking at every six months. It's a fairly simple laboratory evaluation in terms of being able to diagnose an underactive thyroid. This slide was what I want to highlight is for the patients who had total body radiation. So overwhelming majority of our high-risk neuroblastoma survivors who had total body radiation fall into the zero and 10 years of age. This, to me, is the group of patients that I'm very vigilant about actually um, doing surveillance evaluations with ultrasounds to look for thyroid nodules. So thyroid nodules, by definition, I always tell families, I will find a thyroid nodule if I do an ultrasound. I don't want you to worry about that. It's just more you need to know what these nodules are because some of these nodules actually will require more attention in terms of a biopsy. And yes, I have picked up thyroid malignancies that um, we would not have basically been able to discover it as early if we just used physical examination alone. But these curves are what I want to highlight is that your risk for developing a thyroid malignancy is significantly increased when you had total body radiation at a young age. But this is not as scary as much as I'm using the word malignancy. Actually, thyroid malignancies are surgically treated. There's no chemotherapy that goes with that, and you know you just basically go back on your thyroid replacement. Some patients actually may need to just have the surgery or radioactive iodine afterwards. But overall, I think that this is an important part of what I counsel all my survivors who are now teenagers and about to become adults in terms of transitioning to adult care, because these are the patients that we really need to make sure that someone's paying attention uh, to their thyroid gland. What kinds of thyroid do we see? So in general, after radiation exposure, it's the same common type of thyroid cancer. Papillary thyroid carcinoma is the overwhelming most common type of thyroid cancer that we see. So you can either present with an asymptomatic lump that happens in the neck, but that actually is not a common way for um, high-risk neuroblastoma survivors that we have diagnosed with nodules or thyroid malignancies. They actually have very small thyroid glands, and so it's usually by routine ultrasound um, because palpation alone is not the best modality or sometimes in non-thyroid related imaging. So whether it's the uh, surveillance scans, things can get picked up. You're not gonna get your thyroid secondary malignancies two years after your um, you know, neuroblastoma therapy. It's usually there's a sort of lag time, at least a minimum period. The earliest survivors that have found nodules are within four to five years, um, but overwhelming majority of survivors that have diagnosed with malignant thyroid nodules that require treatment are typically you know, they're all teenagers who were exposed to total body radiation when they were young. Again, I don't know what MIBG, high-risk MIBG therapy will do, but those are all the important things in terms of kind of follow-up surveillance. And this is another slide to just really show why ultrasound is helpful. It's a sensitive modality. It does not introduce radiation, but it's the best way in terms of picking up rather than relying on physical exam. So I know that the Children's Oncology Group has not been a big proponent in terms of using ultrasound for evaluation, and rightly because there is no, nothing worse than actually scaring a parent by telling them your kid has a bump or a nodule in their gland. So if you recommend a screening evaluation, you should know as the physician how to handle the results. So, so that's where I am a big proponent of making sure that the screening actually happens in the hands of people who actually know what to do with the results, can reassure you and tell you this nodule really is not that worrisome. We, don't, we just have to keep an eye on it versus I just need to get a biopsy and not necessarily refer everyone that you see with a nodule for biopsy and put you through as parents and also the child through unnecessary procedures that comes with significant psychological uh, stress. So I don't take that lightly in terms of when I um, recommend screening because really you want the person who is giving you the information actually to know, know how to handle the information that they find uh, from the screening evaluation. So how about puberty? Um, I think overall, just to sort of the hormones of puberty, even though it's every parent's nightmare when their child goes through puberty and the moodiness, doc, what's going on with my child and the moodiness. But you know, it is a normal process um, that uh, kind of will happen and um, in terms of sort of how the process happens. So in your brain, you have an area called the hypothalamus that sends signals. So that's the GNRH to the anterior pituitary. These are the signals called LH and FSH. So these are the gonadotropins that will talk to the respective organs or the um, ovaries in females to make estrogen and progesterone, and then the uh, testes in males to make um, you know, testosterone, and then importantly to make sperm. So 
overall in high-risk neuroblastoma therapy where the problem can happen if puberty is an issue um, or the gonadal damage is typically at the site of the gonads. It's not um, really related to the signal production. So patients who had a brain tumor, that can be a problem with actually the gonads being okay, but the signals not being there. But overwhelming majority of patients after neuroblastoma therapy, if they're having issues to go through puberty or gonad-related problems, is because the therapy directly damages the, um, the gonads. So overall for boys, uh, for, for those with, te obviously, boys who have to go through puberty, what the testicle needs to do is two separate things. So you need to make testosterone. That's done by cells called Leydig cells. And then you need to make sperm, and that's called, uh, those cells are called Sertoli cells. So majority of boys will go through puberty fine because the Leydig cells are pretty resistant. They will get affected by alkylating uh, chemotherapy regimen, so cyclophosphamide, but that's dose dependent. But even most of um, my patients with high risk neuroblastoma therapy who had high doses of alkylators actually can go through puberty. It's what happens sort of late um, adolescence, early adulthood, that they just don't fully masculinize. And that can be a reason to have to supplement or then give them testosterone. But overall, early on, boys really have no problems in terms of starting testosterone and going through puberty. Um, if you directly radiate the testes, this is more of uh, an issue for children who had leukemia relapse in their testes. So neuroblastoma in general does not involve the testes in a male. So that becomes a problem for actually making testosterone. What is more of a problem is actually being able to make a sperm. So majority of high-risk neuroblastoma survivors will have infertility based on the alkylators that we give, not only in induction therapy, but also when you go for stem cell transplant. So I think that that definitely, and then there's scatter radiation as well. So again, majority of the total body radiation that's no longer part of the regimens, we would have to worry about some of those scatter to the testes. I think for ovaries, that's a bigger challenge. So. Um, overwhelming majority of females with high-risk neuroblastoma therapy will demonstrate on blood work evaluation or chemical damage to the ovaries. And that's what I tell every family. When I send the blood work, I can tell you that there will be documentation. I can find that the ovaries are unhappy after the therapy. Um, what we cannot predict on blood work alone is if that child can go through puberty or not. So a lot of um, you know, females with high-risk neuroblastoma therapy that I follow will eventually do something on their own. And what I mean by that is make enough estrogen to have breast development. Some actually go on to have um, their first period that we call menarche and then subsequently have issues with uh, irregular periods. And then some girls actually have a really hard time to do anything on their own. These are the patients that I follow very closely, and I tell every family time is really what helps us to sort of, um, you know, find out what direction we're going. But in terms of making a, a, a female go through puberty, you can absolutely do that with pubertal hormones. And I reassure those, um, you know, females because I think in terms of how do I look compared to my friends, they're developing breasts, they're all having periods. I mean, those are the things that I talk to them about. It's not going to be a difficult thing for us to be able to have you get breasts and get periods because I think psychologically that's very, very important uh, in terms of reassuring that child um, with respect to how they do with their peers. I think fertility is a much bigger challenge in females. So there is no perfect blood test to say whether the ovaries have enough eggs in terms of you know, the need in future for uh, assisted reproduction. Um, what we have partnered with is an adult reproductive um, specialist who focuses on cancer survivors. And typically when the patients are reaching 18 years, so they have the emotional maturity, they can go through evaluation. And what that really means is kind of looking at your ovarian volumes, the follicles, et cetera, to kind of get an idea whether with reproductive assistance in the future that will be possible fertility or not. In terms of preservation of fertility at the time of diagnosis, that is still completely researched. So, there are no protocols that at least can offer um, guaranteed harvesting of eggs and basically um, you know, m m preserving them in terms of future uh, fertility. But today in 2014, we're even much more ahead than you know, we were even in 2000 or um, in the decade of 90s. And so it is my hope, and I think that that's the most important area that we really need to focus our group in terms of being able to offer you as parents, not only in the beginning, all the important information with respect to cancer therapy, but to offer you um, um, especially in a child who has not gone through puberty, it means to basically preserve, um, preserve the fertility. 
Um, so we kind of talked about that in terms of the neuroblastoma males and their pu uh, puberty. One thing I highlight is a lot of times the testicular volume on exam, so endocrinologists usually assess how it, um, a normal male testicular function is by the volume, because that's what first sign of puberty in a boy is that the testicle volume starts increasing because the factory is essentially becoming active is how I describe it to the patients and the families. That's where the testosterone production is happening. But if the serotoli cells which make sperm are damaged, the testicular volume is a little bit lower. But that's where the experience of the provider is really important because you can't misjudge how far the child is going through puberty by looking at the volume alone. You really need to do a full uh, overall assessment because you can make plenty of testosterone and really go through puberty and your testicular volume you may not necessarily reflect that. And also I, I counsel the older survivors because I've had patients who went to student health in college and they were really frightened for no reason at all. Something's not right, you know, you need to go see a urologist, et cetera. And that, I really teach them that because these are important um, advocate, that how they can advocate for themselves and not necessarily feel that there's a significant problem but just understanding that this is a, um, you know, sort of a, sequelae of the therapy that really cannot be um, essentially, it's irreversible. But there are other ways in terms of how can you exactly prove that an adolescent male now after puberty is truly infertile. I think sperm analysis is still the gold standard. There are chemical ways of evaluating. So inhibin B is a protein that's made by the serotoli cell and there's been some correlation studies looking at inhibin B and the testicular volume and kind of giving you an indication. But I think the regimens that we use with high-risk neuroblastoma therapy in general, um, uh, unfortunately, infertility in boys is, uh, is an accepted or, you know, in terms of one of the side effects that we see. And then the um, Leydig cells that we talked about, so if there is radiation to the testes, clearly the Leydig cell function may not only be an issue in terms of going through puberty, so those males will need testosterone, but also down the road. Um, and then in terms of the ovarian failure, so I think the young females who have not gone through puberty yet, like the uh, premature, that, that ovary is actually more resistant to the complete damage or failure to therapy. So I worry about the teenager who goes through stem cell transplant. Um, that patient, unfortunately, will not even have a recur um, recovery of their normal ovarian function. It's just the younger girls will have damage, but a lot of times those ovaries are still functional. So I think that that's important, but the, what is the other counterpart is that overall your lifespan for the ovaries will be shorter, meaning that they, these even um, survivors who are able to go through puberty and they start having periods will have premature menopause. So these are patients who will uh, um, is, lose their ovarian function or actually have cessation of ovarian function in their late 20s or 30s. So, and this is another study that actually highlighted the effects of um, age, so the, uh, the darker bars are 0 to t uh, 12, and then the light um, unfilled bars are 13 to 20 years. So these females, basically, as you go and increase the dose of radiation, so really when you have a high dose of radiation to the abdomen and if the ovaries are involved, it, it doesn't matter if you're very young or not. But the younger you are in the lower doses of radiation, it does still make a difference in terms of the younger ovaries are still a little bit more resistant. This is important for high-risk neuroblastoma therapy, again, because we do have to radiate the primary site. And depending on sort of where are all the areas that are involved, the ovaries can definitely be in the field of radiation. So the next area I want to highlight is a new um, uh, area, and that's I'm going to finish soon, is the diabetes mellitus, because it's starting to become some a problem on our radar, and we don't really understand exactly what it is. But I think overall, with respect to how survivors do with body uh, composition and just sort of obesity, neuroblastoma survivors are not in that category. So in general, um, the challenges of obesity are with some other cancers during childhood, like leukemia, but overall, neuroblastoma survivors are not obese. But the challenge we see is the insulin resistance and early diabetes in some of these patients. It's not clear exactly what it is. There's no doubt that abdominal radiation can clearly affect the pancreas in terms of how much beta cell activity where you make insulin. Um, we know that survivors who were exposed to total body radiation are clearly at risk for metabolic syndrome. This is an area that significantly requires research and better evaluation. And the study I showed you from Dana-Farber really characterized this on their group of patients. As you can see, hemoglobin A1c is a value that we use that kind of gives us an average 
um, you know, on average in the last three months, how much of your red blood cells took up blood sugar or glucose, because glucose likes to stick on red blood cells. That's how you actually evaluate someone's compliance with diabetes. That's a number that basically tells us what's normal range. And the dotted line, you can see what's, you know, considered to be normal range for age. And as you can see, the curve is shifted to the right. So higher hemoglobin A1Cs, this is a concern that insulin production is not as appropriate as it should be. And then lastly, I think this is a really important area. It is, I am biased, this is near and dear to my heart. No one has looked at bone health in neuroblastoma survivors. Childhood is a time that you build your bones. This is the only time that you have to mineralize and build your bones is during childhood and early adolescence. So once you make it past 20, that's all the bone building that you have. And then you spend the rest of your life actually remodeling the skeleton that you built. So any, um, chronic childhood illness or childhood cancer therapy that impacts your bones to be able to build themselves as strong as they should will basically have that uh, individual start with a very suboptimal area and then subsequently with their losses. So I think that this is a very important thing. And bone-related problems actually will have um, significant quality of life issues. There are a lot of um, risk factors, so some of them I've listed here. You'll have it in the handout in the interest of time. I won't go through all of it, but building bones takes a coordinated effort. You need nutrition, you need growth hormone, you need sex hormone, um, you need activity, muscle strength. I mean, I think those are all very important factors. A lot of inflammation can negatively impact bone accrual. So I think this is an area that really requires further attention, hopefully in our larger group of uh, neuroblastoma survivors. And lastly, I'm going to touch base on some of the bone-related problems. So osteochondromas are these benign uh, growth spurs that you can see within the bone. They typically tend to present um, around the knee joint area. So this is more commonly seen after total body radiation. Usually they, they declare themselves because of pain with ambulation and doing things. And so when you get an x-ray, you can actually see these bone spurs. Typically, if you have one osteochondroma, you're going to have many more. This is related to the total body radiation. But if it is impacting um, activity and the child is very symptomatic, we typically refer to orthopedic surgeons who are actually comfortable removing this because they, they can be around growth plates. So I think it's really important that you should, if this is an issue for you to travel, to a center with orthopods who are actually experienced to do that. It will significantly improve quality of life. Um, I briefly touched base on the bone age advancement that happens after cisretinoic acid. This is also another important challenge that as an endocrinologist we face. And then the other thing that I always highlight is this uh, condition called slip capital femoral epiphysis. And this, again, we see in patients who had total body radiation at a very young age. And in our group at CHOP, the neuroblastoma survivors after TBI have the highest risk for developing this condition, and it's basically the, um, the femur or the head of the hip joint actually slips out of its socket. It's not painful. You would think that that would be a very painful condition, but typically what it presents is a painless limp that just sort of doesn't make sense. You can pick it up on x-ray. Um, radiologists and orthopedic surgeons who are well-versed into how to examine or how to pick this up on x-ray because it's not the typical type of skiffy that um, happens in non-cancer survivors. And again, in our institution, we saw a significant higher rate than what's reported in the normal population. And really what that is is total body radiation to the developing skeleton and the pelvis. So, and the, the leading list, again, is because the age at which these patients are getting uh, total body radiation. So with this, I hope this was at least informative. My, my goal really was not to scare you, but really to provide you with the information. This is why endocrinology should be an, an important part of survivorship care for your uh, children. Um, the risk factors that I worry about in a young child is radiation exposure, the multi-modality intense uh, therapy, and some of these endocrine problems can evolve over time, so it's not just a one-time thing, but that's why you need to have an established role with a provider. Early recognition is certainly key, and what we really need is future long-term uh, studies that not only looks at these issues and better characterizes them, but kind of looks at them longitudinally and really um, start developing and thinking about ways that we can not only offer therapy, but also how we can prevent that. So with that, I'd like to actually thank you and say that when it comes to neuroblastoma and any childhood cancer, we need to think outside the box. And certainly from a hormonal standpoint, I consider hormones our friends. And so if they don't work, they can make your life miserable, but certainly I'm here to sort of help and put that back in the box. So if there's any questions, I'm happy to answer, but if I've gone over time, I'm happy to address those uh, questions afterwards. Thank you, Dr. Mastuki. We have a question there. 
Do I have time to answer any yeah, questions? Yeah, we'll, we'll do a couple of questions. Um, I know you um, discussed uh, Oh, turn the mic on. Is it off? Oh, okay. Yeah, so I usually tell families a delayed bone age is a bonus. So because that means you have a longer time from a growth standpoint. But you have to keep a tab on that because you have children who have a delayed bone age, but then they catch up and they actually you know, advance. So it's something that I annually get x-rays and I follow that very closely. It's just a bigger challenge when you start with growth-related problems and the bones are ahead. Because overwhelming you know, majority of children with growth hormone deficiency taking cancer therapy out of that will have delayed bone ages. That's the typical experience that the endocrinologists are gonna have. But this is unique in neuroblastoma with the cisretinoic acid therapy that, you know, sometimes I've had as high as four years of bone age advancement. That's actually pretty significant advancement. One and a half to two years, I just tell families we're gonna follow. But that means for me as the provider when I'm following their growth, if they look like they're okay, I need to put that in perspective of where their bones are. So you have to actually graph it for a 14-year-old bone if they're 12 years old, because then that actually can magnify how much their short stature is more of a problem. So it, 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 it does in, you know, get incorporated in terms of how you evaluate and assess the growth. Okay, we'll do one more question. I actually have two questions. <laughs> all right, all right. How many years out of therapy is it appropriate to start the growth hormone? To, when to start growth hormone? Right. So I think that's a fluid dialogue. So I mean, I think, you know, I definitely am starting to have referrals from my colleagues on patients with relapse refractory who went on phase one therapy, but now the disease has uh, gone into remission. So I would say six years, 10 years ago, no one would even consider growth hormone therapy in those patients. But I typically tell families, you know, a good two years of remission or no active growth because majority of tumor, the way the biology is, that's when most of the activity of the tumor is gonna happen. There's nothing magical about two years, but I am not gonna introduce growth hormone within, you know, three to six months coming off therapy, even if your scans show you're in remission. I usually like to have a wait period. Are there any other options to help with growth other than the growth hormone? Uh, so I think nutrition, so it's a multifactorial, but one of the things that I, I want to encourage families is um, I think we need to be a little bit more aggressive with nutritional therapy during treatment. And I know it's difficult to think about an NG tube, but neuroblastoma therapy, especially for high-risk neuroblastoma therapy, is very challenging. And so I think if we start thinking about the nutritional uh, enteral feeds just as important as the chemotherapy and the MIBG therapy overall, I think that that's going to be an important impact to sort of help all the negative effect that's happening on that we have to do. So I don't want to stand up here and kind of belittle my colleagues. I am one of the oncologists that I sit down and do family meetings when patients are diagnosed with high-risk neuroblastoma. But I think those are the little things that we can do. But overall, I think the mechanism of growth-related problems are unique to neuroblastoma that have not been elucidated as clearly as some of the other sort of, oh, it's radiation, they don't make enough growth hormone, give them growth hormone. I am still seeing growth-related problems after TBI is no longer introduced. So, so I'm hoping that's certainly an area of interest and I hope that everyone can kind of help elucidate that better because I think growth in short stature is, is an, an emo it, it's a significant problem in a lot of the patients that I see. Okay, one, one more. Uh, for growth hormones, the benefit in inches versus the um, risk, can you explain that, please? So I think it just depends on the child's uh, history, the cancer history therapy, and sort of what, um, what is the problem. So if a child has, was treated with high-risk neuroblastoma therapy, and now they, because of the cranial radiation or the total body radiation, they're clearly growth hormone deficient, but they have been in remission for over two years, that's a child that I would absolutely advocate. It's not about the inches. To me, growth is not an aesthetic problem. If this child is gonna be significantly impacted where they can't drive, where they can't actually open the cabinets in the kitchen because they're so significantly short, because during uh, childhood and adolescence is really the time that you need to mobilize and have the most growth response. So I, I don't use it as inch per se in terms of the risk factors, but I have an honest conversation with families 
The risk of primary disease recurrence is not supported by the studies. Um, what's important is that as far as the risk of secondary malignancies. And if you as a family feel that if something were to happen, you're going to immediately go to the growth hormone and say it's the growth hormone that caused the secondary malignancy and I should have never given the growth hormone, then I tell the families you're not ready for growth hormone. You know, because we really have no studies that are proving that going on growth hormone therapy is going to increase risk of secondary malignancies, but at the same time, I cannot give you 100% um, you know, guarantee from that perspective. But our experience, um, also in the large centers that we see a lot of survivors, we do not see an increased uh, rate of secondary malignancies in children who deserve to be on growth hormone because they are growth hormone deficient. Um, and the other counterpart that I use is after cancer therapy, if a child has not developed growth hormone deficiency, we don't see an increased risk of you know, the disease recurrence. We don't actually have someone go in and remove the pituitary because they're making growth hormone. So that's sort of the counter argument that I use is if a child develops growth hormone deficiency because of the treatment that we had to give to make the cancer go away, it's really important to consider treating that child and giving them their hormone back. So, so that's just sort of, but it's a one-to-one -one and I work that risk with each family because every family comes to the table very different in terms of what's, what's acceptable to them and what's not. All right, we're going to have another question for you, but I know I think Kate has to catch a flight uh, pretty soon, so we'll, we'll do Kate's presentation, then we're going to come back to you. We've got a question for you. Okay. okay? Not a Thank you.